Okay, we're going to start chapter two, uh, which is about uh, the documentation of hazardous noise uh, levels and exposure to uh, hazardous noise. <clears throat> so this is straight from the text, but here are some um, purposes, important reasons why we measure noise. Number one, to determine if the noise levels are hazardous uh, to safety. Uh, and hearing to identify and label areas with hazardous noise because it has to be posted to identify workers who are exposed uh, who may need to participate in hearing conservation programs evaluate if noise levels meet or exceed OSHA or NIOSH standards to determine if hearing conservation program is necessary <clears throat> uh, and to determine if the use of hearing protection by employees is necessary recommended and if it is necessary how much protection uh, the employee needs. To monitor changes in the noise uh, in the environment, uh, this is quite important. We'll talk about when you have to do that for workers' compensation cases. Um, one thing that I learned, this is just a little clinical note, anytime you are testing somebody uh, and there's any question about workers' comp or you know they're in noise, um, you're doing a baseline audiogram, you're doing an annual audiogram for, <clears throat> for hearing conservation, you should always test 3,000 and 6,000 hertz. And the reason for that is um, 6,000 hertz is often used in the calculation for uh, disability due to hearing loss. And so I always uh, tell uh, my clinicians, audiologists, to test 3,000 and 6,000 hertz for anybody who's in noise, just in case you have to calculate it later and it's not the primary purpose of the appointment. Um, the other thing I always tell, and this is unrelated to industrial, is I tell, even if there's not a 20 dB interoctave difference, I always tell clinicians to test 3,000 hertz when it comes to, if you're going to, if you think you're going to fit a hearing aid, because you want as much information in that one to four thousand hertz range to put in the computer and so sometimes the three thousand hertz will uh, won't kind of fall into uh, the pattern that uh, two and four thousand hertz uh, does and so <clears throat> testing three thousand hertz uh, for hearing aid purposes and then uh, three and six for industrial purposes um, so research is another reason why we're doing that, and then to continue inter uh, research on the interaction of noise exposure with other exposures. <clears throat> so here's some definitions of noise, any audible sound, any erratic or statistically random oscillation, or any disagreeable or undesired sound, such as like fan noise, um, uh, electrical hum, you know, things like that, even though it's not loud. Uh, not potentially damaging, um, it's undesirable and it's considered noise. So the effect of noise on hearing has some factors. Number one, the temporal pattern of the noise, and I think we go through each one of these. Uh, the level of the noise, the frequency content of the noise, and then the overall duration. So there's a concept um, I wanted to go over which is the inverse square law which we've talked about. Um, the inverse square law basically says as you double the distance from a source uh, the sound intensity uh, is reduced by 6 dB. Okay, and We usually talk about it in terms of <coughs> in terms of uh, educational, audiology, um, FM systems, uh, preferential seating, stuff like that. Uh, but this is uh, important uh, to think about when you're potentially moving an employee, you know, trying to do some, some engineering controls to, uh, to reduce the uh, noise exposure for uh, an employee. So the temporal pattern um, of noise could be steady or stationary, uh, continuous, uh, steady state noise. Um, and so if the noise is relatively constant or has negligible, uh, negligibly small fluctuations in level, uh, it's considered continuous. Okay, time varying noise is when it changes over time. So just think of like a white noise versus a, a white noise that's amplitude modulated. If you think back to psychoacoustics, we talked about sinusoidal 
amplitude modulated noise. Remember SAM noise? So that's basically a white noise that's been modulated like a sine wave, so it gets louder and softer. So that would be kind of a time, that would be a time varying uh, noise. Intermittent noise, it's kind of, it happens and it goes away and it comes back. That's pretty simple. Impulse or impact noise. Um, uh, this is when you have a short burst uh, of noise um, or multiple uh, short bursts of noise. Um, and there's some technical definitions. If the interpulse interval is less than a half a second, 500 milliseconds, noise is considered continuous. Okay, um, it's just a different type of noise. Uh, impulse noise usually results from a very sudden release of energy, gunshot, explosion, that sort of thing, and can you and can exceed 140 dB or the that point at which pain is is uh, pretty common. And then this, because it's so um, impactful um, and sudden, it can cause damage to the hair cells. A mechanical damage uh, that creates um, swelling and different things like that. But here we're talking about mechanical damage um, to the cochlea. And a lot of times this can cause permanent threshold shift. So um, here's some calculation. I'd never ask you to do this. Um, I don't think you'll ever have to do this. Perhaps maybe if you work in the military or a uh, place that does a lot of industrial type stuff, but um, there's a calculation for um, <clears throat> um, for steady state noise. The maximum sound level is the greatest or maximum sound pressure level recorded during an observation period. OSHA specified um, it should not exceed 115 dBA. Okay. Um, <clears throat> In a workplace environment. So for impulsive noises or noises that have peak uh, values, um, usually measured using the C frequency weighting with a very fast frequency response. And we're going to talk about the slow versus fast response, uh, recording response, and then the different types of weightings in this PowerPoint. Uh, fluctuating or intermittent noises are measured in terms of a level of a continuous noise that would have been the same total energy as the fluctuating noise. And such measurements are uh, often referred to equivalent sound pressure level. Okay, so when you're measuring fluctuating noise, it's um, challenging to um, then predict what that noise would equal over a given period of time. Okay, and we're going to talk about time-weighted average uh, in this PowerPoint. So, so the frequency, of course, we know what frequency is measured in terms of hertz. The frequency content of complex sounds or noises can be measured in, measured in bands, and we call that one octave. Uh, it can be done in one octave uh, or in third octave bands. I'm going to get my highlighter here. So this is typically the... Um, the mechanism that we use um, <clears throat> to measure the frequency content of noise. So if you think back to um, when you had um, Dr. Kuwake's class in um, uh, instrumentation and you learned about the ambient, the ANSI standard for ambient noise levels in the audiometer, in, in the soundproof booth, I'm sorry, for audiometry. And so if you think back, um, the way they get those is to measure everything in one third octave bands. Okay. And so they have this frequency, it's kind of like an FFT if you think about it, but it has these frequency specific bands. Um, and if you remember from industrial that or I mean from um, uh, the instrumentation class, is that your ambient levels are lower for sound field versus headphones. Okay, so I want you to think about that and we'll answer that on Tuesday. But why is the ambient level uh, in the ANSI standard for maximum permissible um, levels in soundproof booths, why is it um, less? for sound field then, um, let's say under headphones or inserts or what have you. 
So here's the technical calculation for a frequent for um, for a, an octave band, okay. And then you have a third octave band, which is a third of it, and so it's a lot smaller. But again, I'm not going to ask you to calculate this, but it, you get an idea, right? The octave band would go from 700 approximately to 1400 if it's if it's centered on a thousand hertz. So the bandwidth of an octave band filter is 70.7 or 71 percent of the center frequency, and so you can figure out, you know, what what the octave bandwidth would be based on that calculation. So here's the the frequency weighting that I talked about, and again we talked about this in in um, in uh, psychoacoustics if you remember, um, but here's here's the different weighting so if you look at a C weighting uh, sometimes you'll hear people call it more, like a more linear weighting flat rating or weighting sorry <laughs> um, and then a B weighting looks like this and then a C weighting looks like this so if you think about it and you draw the MAF curve you get less uh, uh, sensitivity here, more sensitivity here. Okay, think about this weighting. It's going to reduce the input basically. It's going to weight it. It's going to reduce it just like it's doing here for these lower frequencies and then kind of in the mid frequencies it's going to um, make it more sensitive. So that's the reason why we use the DBA weighting. Um, a lot because if you're taking if you're taking let's say you had somebody working in a factory and uh, they wanted to do a survey of the noise in that area well you don't want to use the flat because it's going to overestimate right it's going to overestimate how much they're exposed to whereas if you use the A weighting it gives you a better idea of what the ear is going to do to the sound and the, the sound pressure level at the eardrum based on the external ear transfer function, right? So that's why we use uh, the A weighting, okay? Um, and most dosimeters, which is something that calculates noise over time, give you an A and C weighting, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Hopefully it does. All right. So... A weighted sound corrections can be applied and see you can see um, minus um, for this center band minus 39 minus 63 zero uh, you add there um, and so hopefully everybody understands the A weighting and then here's the formula which you'll never have to do so there's a concept called the equal energy principle. It says the total amount of noise a person is exposed to over time can be reported in terms of overall energy, which is determined by the SPL of the noise and the duration over which the exposure uh, occurs. Okay. So according to this principle, the amount of biological damage caused by the noise is determined by the total amount of energy. Okay. So equal amounts of energy are expected to produce equal uh, amounts of damage regardless uh, of how the exposure occurs uh, or is distributed over time. Also something called the exchange rate. So um, basically the exchange rate is it's basically a time intensity trade-off. So if you're exposed for less time you can be exposed to uh, more uh, noise. Okay. And so here you have a noise exposure level of 85 dBA over eight hours. Um, it's expected to cause the same amount of exposure of 88 dB over a four hour period, or 91 over two hour period. And so OSHA and NIOSH both, they have different exchange rates, which you'll see, okay? Um, and so this doesn't really apply to impulse noises, but more steady state noises. So here's your, <clears throat> here's your um, exchange rate. You can see for OSHA, it's 85 dB, you can be exposed for 16 hours. Or as NIOSH, you can only be exposed for 8 hours. And then down here, once you hit 90, it's 8 hours. 85 dB, you have to start implementing a hearing conservation program. So that's it for here. We're almost at 15 minutes. Um, we'll go over the rest in class.